Welcome. This is the Lifetime Cash Flow through Real Estate Investing Podcast. This is where you'll learn strategies to help you achieve lifetime financial freedom through real estate investment. Your host, Rod Cleef, has owned over 2,000 homes and apartments. And he brings experts in all aspects of real estate investment and management onto the show. Now, here's your host, Rod Cleef. Welcome to Lifetime Cash Flow through Real Estate Investing. I'm Rod Cleef, and I'm thrilled you're here. I know you're going to get incredible value from the dynamic lady we're interviewing today. Her name is Julie Broad. Uh, she's a successful real estate investor. She's also a best-selling author, speaker, trainer. Uh, she and her husband own over $21 million with the commercial real estate. And, uh, you know, she's a real dynamo. But, Julie, I'm thrilled you're on the show. Thank you, and thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, so please expand on my introduction and, and tell us who Julie is. Tell us your story. Yeah, you bet. Well, first, I'm Canadian, so I'm from pretty much the opposite side of North America from where you're at. <laughs> oh, that's right. You're up, you're like near Vancouver or north of there or, some, or somewhere yeah, around there? Yeah, I'm on, I'm on Vancouver Island, so I'm even further west than Vancouver, the city itself. Um, oh, but, but I yeah. love Vancouver. Vancouver's beautiful. It's been probably 15 years since I've been there, but uh, it's beautiful. So, yeah. what do you do? What do you do in Vancouver Island? Yeah, so we're we're real estate investors, and also I do a lot of speaking and writing and things like that. And my husband's actually an actor now. Uh, the the wow. beauty of of real estate is that you can pursue. You know, once you have a, a decent portfolio. Uh, you don't have to keep buying real estate. Real estate can allow you to do the things that you've always wanted to do. And a few years ago, we kind of hit that point, and my husband decided he wanted to become an actor. So uh, he's having fun pursuing that and doing commercials and TV shows and movies and, and lots of crazy things. So wow. that's kind of a, you know the, the short version of what we're doing. But I, I got into real estate in 2001, and basically, I was about to go back to school to do my MBA, and I, I really felt like I'd just finished paying off my undergrad, and I was thinking about graduating again with nothing but debt. And so I really wanted to get the limited amount of money that I had working for me while I was in school so that I'd have something when I graduated. And the only real answer that I came up with, because you can, you know, with real estate, you can leverage it, it's so beautiful, um, was to buy a couple of rental properties and have those growing equity and, and building some cash flow for me while I was in university. So that kind of kicked it off. And uh, and then, then my boyfriend at the time, who's now my husband, uh, he partnered with me on those deals, and we both really liked it. So we just kept going. Wow. So the first properties, were they single family, or did you get right into multifamily right out of the gate? No, we we've, we haven't done a lot of multifamily. We, we started oh. with a duplex and a single family home. And from there, we've done we've done as big as a sixplex in terms of. Oh, that's um, right. You did some other asset classes, if I recall. Yeah, we've okay. we're into medical office buildings and dental buildings and dental office buildings and things like that. Um, All right. That's our commercial space now. But we we've kind of built up. We built our equity and our our capital through uh, single family homes with suites. Usually, uh, initially, that's where we started. Right. That's right. That's right. It's all coming back to me now. So, you know, I know uh, you're you've got you're a best selling author. You wrote a book called uh, More Than Cash Flow, and I think your newest release is called The New Brand You regarding branding. So, tell tell my listeners how they can benefit from branding themselves. Uh, I think you've got some great examples about that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we got into, or I, I really was the driving force behind us building our brand, because in uh, in 2008, I decided to quit my job and go at the real estate thing full time and start building a real estate education and training company. And for your listeners who were investing in 2008, um, or even just you know paying attention to what was happening in the world, uh, it was a terrible time to be in real estate because the housing markets crashed. And you know Lehman Brothers collapsed, and the lending rules completely changed. I mean, the banks, the banks in Canada were never quite as free with the money as they were in the states, but still, uh, banks in Canada completely tightened up as well as in the U.S. And so you couldn't fund real estate deals, even as a homeowner, let alone as a real estate investor. So you know, it was a perfect time to to quit my job <laughs> and wow. focus on building two businesses in the real estate space and. Yeah, it was it was a tough timing, but the one thing is that um, at that time we really needed to raise capital because we couldn't finance through the bank, and 
we didn't have the funds ourselves because I had quit my job and I was the primary income earner. Because at the time, my husband was actually a mortgage broker. So. <laughs> oh, no. well, that's actually not a bad training ground for what you were for what you were doing. So you, but you need, but you needed to raise money. So let's talk about that for a minute. So, so yeah. you I, you did syndications, I take it. No, what we did actually, we so at that time we we decided to partner with people. So okay. we would have we would basically look for people who wanted to get into real estate, didn't want to do any of the work, um, and we would have their capital invested in a deal, and then we would be 50-50 owners with them. So we did all the work of finding the deals and negotiating everything and then overseeing things and even to a degree being property management. And in exchange, you know, they got a pretty solid return on their investment and didn't have to worry about it, and we did all the worrying. And Mm. that was kind of our model. But the branding piece came in because trying to convince people to invest in real estate at that time was impossible. I mean, people wanted nothing to do with it. And we 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 had we did a hundred calls almost and were rejected so many times that I finally thought this is ridiculous. We need to have people coming to us, and that was really what I started to build our brand and put our name out there. You know, with YouTube videos and started to speak. And it took a little bit of time, but eventually people started calling us saying, "Hey, I have money and I'd like to invest in real estate. Can you help me?" And then that was such a much stronger position to be in than to be the person out there chasing the money. To have it chasing you is such a strong position. Well, let, let's let's talk about that for a minute. So 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 you just to recap, you tried to outbound calls and and develop tried to develop relationships with investors uh, and were unsuccessful because of the market climate. Of course, oh eight oh nine was was a train wreck uh, uh, for me and lots of, and just about anybody in real estate and. So what you did was uh, you created a brand and you did this through YouTube videos. That was part of it. Okay, give me an idea of what's the context in some of these YouTube videos. Were you were you educating about real estate? Were you talking about specific deals? What what was the premise for the for the videos? Yeah, everything I've done has been value, focused on adding value to people. So whether they were going to invest with me or not, I wanted them to get some value out of what I was doing. So so my videos were all kinds of tips. Um, and the article, I wrote a lot of articles too. I did YouTube and a lot of writing. And, okay. Uh, and it was always driven towards action items. Like, okay, if you want to do this yourself, here's what you can do. And of course, there's always a camp of people that do want to do it themselves. But then there's a camp of people that are like, oh my gosh, that sounds horrible. I don't want to deal with it. Will you do it for me? And just by virtue of trying to help as many people as I could and adding value with tips, you know, as simple as how do you find good tenants or how do you choose a deal? How do you analyze a deal? Um, how do you hire the right contractors? Uh, and those kind of tips. Uh, and of course, sharing what's working and what's not working because we were very active doing a deal almost every single month. Um, you know, I was often on site filming what was going on too. So those kind of things were were what I did. And and like I said, it wasn't instant, but over time, people really started to recognize it and gravitate to it because it was value added. So, so, um, I, I mean, were you, I mean, to dig in just a little bit deeper, when you were like placing your YouTube videos, were you, were you doing search engine optimization to, to, to rank them? Were you doing any YouTube marketing or was it just all organic growth? It was all organic. At, I mean, nope, at the no time, kidding. It, at the time, this was also 2009 when I started this. So there was not that many YouTube videos. I mean, there was, but it's not like today where everybody films them. Um, Right. So I was a little ahead of the curve in that angle, and you didn't. You just had to post something, and people watched it. (laughs) No kidding. No kidding. Well, I will tell you. Let me add a caveat to all this, guys. Any time that uh, all marketing really in today's day and age is education. All all effective marketing in today's day and age is education-based marketing. And so anytime you can add value and educate, you're really marketing yourself and you're selling. And and people are so used to being sold that when they see something and you're just adding value to them, they sell themselves. Would you agree? Absolutely. And again, it's not instant. That's the one thing. Well, I put two videos up and nothing's happened. You right. have to do it consistently, and, and you can't do it expecting that when you give somebody something, they're going to, you know, they're going to come and back to you and say, "Hey, I want to work with you." Um, you have to be consistent about it, and it takes time to establish trust and for people to see you as an expert. Sure, sure, sure. So, uh, so you did the videos. People started contacting you, um, and then uh, you started putting these deals together. Yeah, I mean, we were still putting deals together in the meantime. We were still right. out there hustling, but um, but yeah, it got so much easier as as we built our reputation in Canada. 
as trust, trustworthy people who were doing good things in real estate, people started calling us. And, and that was just such a great position to be in because now we're having conversations trying to figure out if we're a fit to help them versus trying to convince them to work with us in the first place. And, and that's really important to think about because um, not everybody with money is a good fit for you to work with. You really want to align the person that's sitting across from you and, and figure out, you know, does this person have similar goals? Like, do they want a longer-term investment? Are they expecting returns that I can reasonably deliver? Um, are they risk-averse? Because things go wrong in real estate, even when you're doing great deals. I mean, roofs leak and plumbing goes, and things happen. So if this person across from you is really skittish and really risk-averse, um, when you have to call them to tell them, you know, we need a little cash because something's gone wrong, uh, you have to kind of think through, is this person a good fit for me? Can I see myself having that conversation and having it go okay? Um, you know, those kind of things. So you want to think about who's your ideal investor before you get into these situations, and, and it helps you, but it also is better for that person. And uh, then you're looking for fit, and you're not trying to sell anybody on anything. Sure. You, you, whenever you sit down with a prospective investor, you, you run through some questions and make sure that your interests are aligned. You know, for example, you know, a lot of investors out there uh, are buying property with the sole purpose of ultimately selling it, like maybe in a five to eight year window. And, mm-hmm. you know, and, and so those investors have a, have a game plan. Me personally, I, my liquidation event is a refinance. I, 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 I bring in investors and I, I uh, let them know they're going to get a rate of return. And then, and then ultimately, um, We'll refinance the asset to give everybody their their initial capital back, and then you know we hold on long term for the cash flow. So you want to make sure that whatever your model is is going to fit for their parameters. And you know you're going to meet investors that have the you know the uh, uh, you know, the IPO or the uh, internet based uh, digital company type mindset. Oh, you know I want to put money in, and we're going to have a huge upside because the company went public or something. And that's you know that's not the kind of mindset that you're looking for. So, okay, so so um, so you so you started. You know, I know you've done you did some syndications and you did a lot of that stuff uh, it, later on. Tell 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 my listeners if you know in today's day and age with YouTube being more prolific, how can they brand themselves and set themselves apart to position themselves like you did as an authority? What are some suggestions you would make to them? Yeah, for sure. First of all, you have to get clear on a few things so that you're consistent with your messaging. Because when you put yourself out there, you do you want to be seen as consistent, and people understand you know what you have to offer. So, in in the book, I cover I call it the brand magic formula, and I'll just run through it really fast, and then talk about some specific things to execute it. But um, the magic is the acronym. So M is for message, and that's just about being clear and concise on on the message of how you help others. Uh, a is for appearance, and this is this is just basically you know I love sweatpants. They're my they're one of my favorites, but I'm not going to go out and raise money in sweatpants because that's not when I feel my best. Because right? you won't get any. <laughs> exactly, you don't really look like a successful real estate investor in sweatpants. Let's say that even if right. they're high end ones. <laughs> So, yeah, it's just about wearing something that makes you feel confident and makes you feel like the successful person that you are or that you want to be. Um, so it's just considering that and, of course, considering everything in terms of appearance, business cards and websites and things like that, too. G is for Google results, and this is something I think is very important to pay attention to these days. Um, Google Glass is out there. Uh, um, um, Apple announced quietly that they bought facial recognition software and and body language reading software earlier this year, basically what's coming down the pipe technology-wise is when you walk in the room, somebody can snap a picture of you and Google you before they even know your name. So whatever Google is saying about you is something to pay attention to because somebody's not going to invest with you if Google has uh, results that aren't good or that they can't even find you and see you as an expert and kind of verify that you, you've done what you say you've done. So that's the G is for Google. I is for I am an expert in And this one is just really picking a niche and focusing on something. Even if you're not an expert today, if you pick a niche, then you'll become an expert really fast. So in the multifamily space, you know, I have a colleague who's a really smart multifamily investor. He focuses on, I I think it's 30 to 40 unit apartment buildings in a couple of different cities. Um, You could focus on neighborhoods. That was always our specialty was neighborhoods. Our commercial and residential (coughs) properties are all in three or four key neighborhoods because I can stay on top of what's going on and become, I can be the person in the town that knows the most about those neighborhoods. So it's just that. 
And C is for character, which comes down to your values and those things about you that people will connect with. Because people want to do business with people they like, so you need to be sharing things about your personal life and what's going on with you so people connect with you. That doesn't mean you tell everybody all your problems, but it does mean you find common interests and share them with people. So those are some of the things to think about for your brand. And then in terms of how you're getting them out there, it does come down to how you're connecting with people. So you can do that through YouTube. If you're using YouTube today, the quality expectation is much, much higher. So you do want to have, uh, I mean, the good news is your phone, whether, whether, whether you have an Android or an iPhone, that's a very high quality camera. Just get a mic and get some good lighting and you're off to the races. But that mic is important, having good quality sound and lighting makes all the difference, and the expectation of quality is there for YouTube now. But just so you can plug a mic right into the phone then is what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. There's a couple okay. of good brands out there. The one I use is uh, it's called iSure, I think, S-H-U-R-E. It's a good one. plugs right into the iPhone, and, and just make sure you've got a little tripod so it's stable, and you're off. You're off. You're good. You can do Facebook Live too. That's a great way to get your brand out there now is with Facebook Live. And as a real estate investor, um, to be live on the site of a, of a property you're looking at or a renovation and to just go live from that, that is fantastic. That shows so, so, you're so on let the me, ground. Let me interrupt. So, guys, yeah. what, what she's saying is build yourself as the local expert. And you can do it through literally with an iPhone and a microphone and – and positioning yourself as as the local resident expert in that niche, so that's critical mm-hmm. because you can't be all things to all people. Um, so so they can record videos and give tips on how to how to you know do all these things from renovate to to manage to to find to you know all of those numerous topics. Um, and let me ask you the G, the Google. So what could they mm-hmm. do? What could they do to rank themselves or get some get some things posted in Google and and have some some positive uh, uh, search results. Uh, any suggestions there? Yeah, you bet. So, I mean, I do recommend you own your own name if you can. So if you haven't oh. already bought your name as a URL, I highly recommend you do that if it's available. Um, and so, I mean, like juliebroad.com in my case. And you can right. always redirect it somewhere else if you don't want to set up a website there. But own your own name. Um, and if you don't want to have a big website right now, just have social media presence because that will show up. Um, When somebody Googles your name, uh, your LinkedIn profile, a Facebook page, those kind of things will be some of the earliest things to show up well before even your website. Um, And so that's just a simple way to have you be found. And then if they go to your Facebook page and they see a bunch of Facebook Live videos coming from the apartment buildings you've been looking at or working on, uh, now that's instant credibility and even to a degree instant celebrity. And that that builds trust and that builds a lot of authority quickly. No, I love it. I love it. No, that's that's very good advice. Um, so I forgot what the M was. I got the GIC. What was the M again? Your message. So clear message. and concise message. Yeah. Clear and concise. So yeah. So decide what you know what tack you're going to be. If you're you know if you're in your market and you want to buy multifamily properties, um, do what she's saying. Go out there and 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 chronicle your. Your study, pro, you know, as you're evaluating deals, chronicle it and and give and add value to other aspiring investors, and you instantly position yourself. And uh, so, uh, what was the? I, actually, I didn't get the C. What was the last one? The C. C is character. So that's character. your values. That's the personality. Because again, a lot of people, and this is a, a mistake I see a lot of investors make, is they build this this corporate looking website, but the reality is maybe you're a two man show. And your ideal investor, if they wanted to invest corporately, they're probably going to invest in REITs. Um, right. And so they're looking for that person who is on the ground that's going to take care of them. And if you're trying to be something you're not, it's not going to resonate with the people that you most want to connect with. It's not going to resonate with your ideal investor. So your character kind of comes down to a variety of things. But if you're always thinking about how am I going to connect with my ideal person and how am I going to add value to whoever's watching or listening or I'm talking to, then that will just start to build you up as a strong brand and a strong communicator. This is great. This is really good advice for those of you that are thinking about, a pro, you know, looking for investors to help syndicate deals or joint venture in deals with you. Uh, you know, this is a, a really good strategy. Uh, I noticed... Oh, sorry. I was go ahead. Say, it doesn't just help to attract capital. It, attra- it helps you to get deals. Cause we've no had- kidding three or four deals come our way in very hot markets 
when there was bidding wars. But people with a lot of tenants, you know, if there's a three, even in our case, it's a three, it was a three uh, triplex, and the guy didn't want to have people schlepping through the building, you know, upsetting his tenants all the time. So he called us, and we got a fantastic deal because there was no realtors involved. Uh, you know, so things like that, as people know who you are, you can get great deals that way too. Wow, wow. No, that's 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 uh, really good advice. Now, I know you also talk about whether somebody should uh, quit their job and become a full-time investor or just, you know, find a new job. What, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people look to real estate to solve a problem that it can't always solve. Um, I think I, I like to approach it from a lifestyle design. So look at your life and think about what do you want your ideal day to be. And I'm not talking about sipping a margarita on the beach kind of day because most of us probably can't do that for 365 days a year. We'd go a little crazy. We wouldn't want to, right. Yeah. So I, I'm talking like your ideal day where you're productive, you're, you're generating an income and you know, still spending time with family. So you kind of picture your ideal day and then figure out what you need to do to create that day. And sometimes real estate is the answer but not always. And so I always kind of recommend, you know, do a few deals first because a lot of people are wanting to quit their job before they've even done any real estate. Like figure out if you like it and if you really do want this to be a major part of your life to begin with and then start going from there. Um, but ultimately, if you, if you go from that lifestyle design and build it back from that or build forward from that, work backwards, you know what I mean, um, right. figure out what your ideal day is and build it out then real estate might be the answer to help you. And if it is, great, but take baby steps and build it before you leave your job. Make sure that it is something that you want to have as your full-time gig because there's a lot going on in real estate, and uh, and it's not always the full-time gig that you hope it is. <laughs> Well, no, certainly when you're getting started. I, I mean, I, guys, don't quit your job. For God's sakes, don't do that. That's absolutely a mistake, in my opinion. But for frankly, for the very reason that you're going to need that income and that stability to convince a lender that you're worth lo loaning money to, if no other reason than that. But real estate you know, is something that you ease into, uh, in my opinion. I, I don't think you, you, you burn the ships and, and, and get started. I mean, certainly you can, but I think that's a very risky way to do it, and, and I don't recommend it. And, and like Julie says, you need to make sure you love it. Now, I love it. Uh, Julie, you love it. But, but you know, um, not, you know, you, and I tell people, if, you, if you're not sure if you love it, associate pleasure with it. You know, make sure that, you know, you, you, you mentally associate pleasure with the different things that you're doing in it. But, but you're right. Uh, you, you need to be certain it's what you love because, like I tell my son, you know, if you do what you love, work is play. And that's really, since you're spending most of your life doing it, that's, that's the way you should, you should operate uh, in whatever it is you, you decide to do. So did you have any mentors uh, getting get rolling here in the whole real estate thing, Julie? Yeah, it's one of those things, actually. Um, in my book, More Than Cash, I talk about it. We had the wrong mentors at the start. Um, oh. And uh, it's funny. I, I highly recommend people figure out what they want to Again, it comes back to that lifestyle. And then go and find people who are doing what you want to do and work with them. We kind of fell into the whole late-night infomercial trap and, uh, and worked with a kind of a get-rich-quick company and hired oh. their mentor out of the gate. And uh, honestly, this, the guy that we ended up working with, later on I found out, um, you know, he, he, he owned a rental car. He didn't own a rental car. He drove a rental car and lived in a hotel. And he basically said it was, he was living a fully tax-deductible lifestyle. But really, it turns out he had no money. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's, put, that's putting a spin on your situation. That's hilarious. Wow. Yeah, and so this was our mentor. Um, and we oh. did a lot of terrible deals that made for phenomenal writing. My book is packed with stories that... <laughs> That are great stories, but you don't want to live through that. <laughs> oh. And and so that's really our early mentor. So we were a little burned, and we really didn't seek out any sort of help for a long time. We learned a lot of things the hard way, um, but that's a tough, tough way to do it. And when I went, when I quit my job and decided to do this full time, uh, one of the big things was that we really needed to surround ourselves with people doing what we wanted to do and with a similar mindset. And so both my husband and I sought out mentors and also mastermind groups, and that was key. If we hadn't have done that, I don't think we would have 
uh, taken the leaps that we took that we needed to take to be able to create the success and really, really grow our portfolio and my education and training company. Uh, so it's really, really important. But I think you have to be grounded in terms of what you want to create before you find those people because the, the get-rich-quick scheme, it's, schemes, it's not us, but it just sounded so good, and they're so good at selling. Oh, yeah, guys, guys, <laughs> get-rich-quick get scheme. The operative word is the last word, okay? Get-rich-quick scheme. There is no get-rich-quick. There's get incredibly wealthy if you learn, educate yourself, and take your time, incredibly wealthy, but there's no get rich quick. So, you know, and, and I get disgusted when, in fact, you know, I was gonna, I was gonna join, do the speaking circuit, gosh, uh, 15 years ago, and I talk about this sometimes because I interviewed a, 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 a fellow speaker, a guy named Scott Sheila, on my show, and I talked about this where I was gonna do it, and I joined this speakers group, and, I got so sleezed out by these guys mm-hmm. trying to get people to run to the back of the room and spend money. I decided not to do it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, Scott's an exception to that. But let me ask you this, Julie. Is there a particular type of person that you think is better suited for uh, real estate investing? Not necessarily. That's an interesting question. Um, I, I don't necessarily think there is because my husband okay. and I are, are both really incredibly different. He's highly numerical. Um, very analytical. I, I always tease him about doing his dances with spreadsheets. That's what he does for fun. And <laughs> <laughs> and, and I That's walk funny. into a property, and I can tell you within 60 seconds if it's a good deal and if I want to buy it, and I haven't run a single number. I mean, I okay, know my stop, market. Okay, stop, stop, yes. stop right there. Stop right there. I, I want to add emphasis to that. Guys, this is what you get when you're out there analyzing deals a lot, okay, you get that intuition. I remember the interview I had with Grant Cardone. He looked at real estate for five years before he bought something. And it's like the movie, or like, I'm sorry, like the book Blink, where you literally, Maxim Gladwell's book, where you see something and you know it's a good deal. And I had the same thing, Julie. I mean, literally, I could walk in a property and within one minute know if it was a good deal or not. And you build that intuition if you're out there studying deals. So like I tell people, though, when I coach them, it's, it's do two things. Get the book study, do a course, read the books, get the, the paper or video knowledge. And, and of course, these podcasts without question add value as well. But, yeah. but you need more than that. So you get that. While you're doing that, you're out there kicking the tires. You're developing relationships with brokers. You're looking at deals. You're immersing yourself in this business so that you develop that intuition. So I'm sorry. I just wanted to add an oomph to what you just said. Yeah, for sure. It's boots to the ground. And you, you, yeah, I, I didn't necessarily, I'd been focused on investing for many years by the time I was at that, but I never did the heavy analysis that my husband did. I came at everything from a marketing and strategic point of view, whereas he was heavy analytical, two very different personalities. And yet I think we're both very good at what we do. So I, I think it's well, you probably complement each other. Frankly, I, I mean, yeah, those two, those two, yeah. those two, uh, uh, those two traits are very complementary. My brother is extremely analytical, and I'm not. And mm-hmm. you know, in this multifamily real estate space, you need to have some, and you know, there's an analytical component for sure because you're doing financial analysis. You're looking at you know what the property may do, a pro forma. Uh, you're looking historically what it has done. You're looking to see you know if you can if you can elevate rents or decrease expenses. So those are you know. There's some analytical component to those things, but you're also selling. I mean, you're selling, you know, the seller, you're selling the broker, you're selling your potential investors, you're selling your renters. I mean, there's there's a definite sales and marketing component as well. So I can see, you know, in your situation with your husband that you guys are a perfect match for, for this business, correct? Yeah, it's a great team. And that's kind of where I was going with it is that, you know, whatever you have as your skill and your, your strength. Surround yourself with the people who will fill in the gaps because real estate requires all skills, which is why I don't think any one type of person necessarily is more suited for it because no matter what your strength is, there's other things that you're still going to need help with. So you just need to build out the right team so that you're surrounding yourself with the people who are strong at the things that you're not as strong at. Perfect answer. Absolute perfect answer. So, so let me ask you this. Did you, do you have other components to your team? I mean, I know it's you and your husband. You've got his anal- analytical skills and your sales and marketing skills. Are there any other people on your quote-unquote team? When we were really active, we had a full-time assistant handling all the paperwork because we, couldn't, we were drowning in paperwork with renovations sure. and, and deals. Um, we don't need that now that we're just in the management phase. We've got a property management company. Um, we have contractors, so you know 
all kinds of things that you have to fix um, and that come up. We've got trusted contractors. We've got a, a real estate specializing accountant and a real estate specializing lawyer. Very important to have the real estate specialization. We worked with a small business accountant for a while, and they just they, – there's no, – No, 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 no. It's a completely different world, and uh, you, you, you've got to have those professionals, uh, accounting and, and legal professionals, you want people that – that have a specialty in the real estate field and ideally invest themselves because mm-hmm. then they understand it. And, you know, there's so in the, just in your accounting example, I mean, there's so many advanced uh, strategies like, like cost segregation, which I've talked about, you know, where you can, in, where you can uh, accelerate the depreciation, which are incredibly advantageous to attract investors to your deals uh, and or maximize for yourself. So no, I completely agree. Um, so so those are your team. So, you know, what words of wisdom – well, hang on. And before I get asked that question, because that's, that's a good uh, kind of an ending question. You know, you, you've got something in your bio that talks about making sure what's at stake when you decide where you're going to invest. And you even reference making sure that it saves your marriage and your closest relationships. Can you talk about what you mean by that? <laughs> well, I think, I think that's referencing uh, – in our early days, when we were raising money, we we took money from friends and family. Um, ah. and even though, uh, yeah, it, you know that gut feeling like, ooh, I don't think I should be doing this, but you know, you just wanted to keep doing deals. And I think at the end of the day, if you put relationships first, uh, it's it's far more important to stay friends with people and to have your family be your family. Uh, and I think there's certain situations where it certainly can work out to partner with, with family and friends, but it, it changes the relationship. So you really want to know that going in, that it really does change the relationship. You know, dinner now becomes how's our investment doing, where it used to be, you know, what's up with the kids and how are things going at work, you know, catching up like that way. So it really does change the relationship. And you have to take a close look at what if something goes tragically wrong, what's that going to do to this relationship? And most of the time what I've found is if you look at that scenario, you're going to be so wrought with guilt that you've, you've lost your friend or your family member money that you just don't want to take the money in the first place. And I think you just really have to think about those relationships very, very carefully uh, before you work with people. It uh, doesn't mean you don't, but just really have open conversations and think about it. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally got that memo on the wrong side of that memo, and uh, both with my parents and with my brothers, and, uh, you know, when deals went south, it took, it really did damage the relationships, and we had to, you know, we had a long healing process, and, I mean, we're very, very tight now, uh, but, you know, it, it, it definitely took its toll, so guys, I hope you heard that, so be very, very careful, tread very carefully if you're going to involve family or friends in your deals because it can totally change change the relationship like like Julie said. So, you know, um I know I I know you've had your ups and downs. Uh if you could go back uh in time and tell your younger self something about this business, what would you, what would you say? Ooh. Let's see. I don't I don't know what I would say except for cuz I'm glad. I'm I'm happy even everything that we did wrong. I'm happy we went through it because I really think that we are uh, stronger because of it and smarter because of it. But Even I, the downs. So, so you, you, yeah. you treat them as seminars like I do, where you learn and mm-hmm. you grow from them. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, truthfully, I have a best-selling book because of the crap we went through. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I made it worthwhile. <laughs> that's funny. That, that's that's uh, turning uh, lemons into lemonade. Good. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I hear you. And I had the same thing happen. You know, it's funny. Out of, out of my ashes, I built a you know a ten million dollar litigation support company. Uh, but uh, but you know, it, it wasn't my love. But uh, you know, it's obvious you lo- you're loving what you're doing. Yeah. You no. Know, so let me ask you another question. You know, I I do um, a little five to eight minute clip every week called your driving force success tip. And I, uh, I talk about the psychology of success and how 80% of your success in anything is your psychology. And really only 20% is the mechanics, the technical knowledge, you know, what, where do you get your bubbly, exciting, uh, personality from? Cause I've seen your videos and, 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 and you've always got this great attitude. You know, what makes Julie jump out of bed? What keeps you motivated and driven? I think ultimately it always comes back. First of all, to me, 
looking forward to creating that ideal day. And my ideal day is helping other people live their ideal day too. So I get out of bed in the morning really excited, thinking about what can I do to add value to other people today, even if it's entertainment, right? If I, if I shoot a video and maybe you don't learn a tip but you laugh, that's good. You know, I'm adding value. I'm making your day a little brighter. And that really gets me excited. And, and I also love taking action and seeing results. You know, that's, that, I get fired up about that. So even when I'm scared, I ultimately, I look at it and go, you know, is this something I really want to do or is this something I'll regret if I don't do? And then I just go do it, even though I'm almost always shaking in my boots if it's something new. But uh, I just, I love seeing what can happen and, and finding out what's possible. Because I don't think a lot of us push ourselves to that point to see actually what we're capable of and what is possible for our lives. Do you have any role models, any, any people that you look up to in this regard that, uh, that uh, you, you, you try to model? Not, not specifically in that regard, but my grandma okay. Broad is a pretty phenomenal. I actually dedicated an entire chapter to her in this new book. Um, mm. her, and her philosophy, you know, if I say to her, have a great day, Grandma, she says, well, it's my own fault if I don't, dear. You know, I uh, love it. She just approaches life with, you know, if she can control it, she does whatever she can to put it in her favor. And if she can't control it, she accepts it. And so she doesn't waste a lot of time worrying about things that are out of her hands. And uh, and then she takes action on the things that she doesn't like that she wants to fix. Very valuable advice, guys. You ignore what you can't control because it's just going to drive you crazy. Do you have any favorite quotes? Well, one of my quotes is the missing piece is always action. So I, I like. Oh, I that love quote. that. I yeah. love that. I love that. <laughs> Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins says massive action. But you know, I, I completely agree. The the, the 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 solution to fear and the solution to any problem is massive action. That's a great quote, Julie. I love that one. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's, that's my that's my quote for the day. <laughs> all right. Well, listen. Um, uh, we're nearing the end of the show, and I was hoping you could leave my listeners in the multifamily real estate space one last golden nugget, one last little bit of advice. You know, what what uh, what would you tell them if they're thinking about getting started or or you know just getting things going? What what would you recommend to them? Just get clear on that ideal day that you want to create for yourself, and find somebody who can help you do it. Uh, there's really there's really no point in suffering through trying to figure it out, making a bunch of n- unnecessary mistakes. Go get help, but ultimately take action because it's the things that you don't do that you really will regret, and it's the things that you do do, even if they don't go 100% or like you want. Like I said, um, I, I'm I wouldn't change anything, and we've gone through a ton of ton of troubles, but I wouldn't change anything because it's brought me to where I am today, and I'm incredibly grateful and incredibly happy with where I'm at. So, but take action. Well, and- Go for it. That's awesome. Julie, uh, again, her books are More Than Cash Flow and the new brand you, and uh, you've added a ton of value, and I'm very grateful for you being on the show today. And good luck good luck in all you do, and I hope we can stay in touch. Yes, thank you. It was very fun. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Talk to you later. Bye now. Thank you for listening to the Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing Podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, please subscribe and then take a moment to visit iTunes and leave a five-star rating and review. For more resources to connect with us further, please visit our website at lifetimecashflowpodcast.com. Tune in next week for our next show.